So thanks everyone for coming to today's talk on accessible automation. We have two fantastic speakers today, uh, Will K9 from OpenTrons and Dr. Nicola Patron from the Ellum Institute Biofoundry. I will start by introducing our first speaker, uh, Will K9. So Will comes from a background in community organizing and political campaign management and is the co-founder and CPO for a company called OpenTrons, which provides open source hardened software for democratizing lab robotics and biology. Will, please go ahead. Um, well, yeah, thank you for having given me the opportunity to tell this story. Um, I, I really appreciate that, you know, I know that you guys in Cambridge are sort of part of like one of the OG open source hardware science communities and, and people have been really pushing that. I'm from Brooklyn, which I'd say is another place that has really, you know, with GenSpace and um, open source hardware in general, really been pushing that. And so I, I, it's a real privilege to be able to share this story. Um, as, as I was said, my name is Will, um, and I co-founded a company called OpenTrons that makes open source affordable lab automation. Um, and I'm just going to be basically giving an the whole arc of my work in OpenTrons um, and, and sort of the, the startup saga of it. Um, and with really the, the hope that you all will see that this is, A, I got super duper lucky and anyone can get super duper lucky and B, all the things that I did, you could probably also do too. So, um, so without, with that, I'll just start diving in. Um, so, this is just the one slide whole story uh, real quick. Um, my co-founder and I, Chu, started off as open source collaborators in 2013 um, and went to Shenzhen, where our supply chain is in China, um, with a program called Accelerator. Then we did a Kickstarter um, and launched our first robot. After that, we joined Y Combinator, where we really started to learn how to be a high growth startup. Um, and that's really when the march towards growth and, and just getting our product on, on the market just started um, and, and went from there. Um, so my background, as, as you said, I'm a campaigner, a, an activist. Um, I started at a very early age just thinking about how I could make the world better and settled on electing Democrats to um, office. And this is me, the moment that Barack Obama won the presidency, I'm the body man, which is basically the personal aide of a, a person who then became a congressman, which in the United States is, you know, we have the Senate and the Congress. And so Congress is, is a more local. Um, this guy was from part of Idaho, which is a very rural mountainous region of the United States. Um, and we won as Democrats in a district that had always been won by Republicans. And um, in fact, it was the most Republican leaning district for any Democrat to win in um, since Abraham Lincoln. So that was a really major moment for me. It started my, um, my career in politics, um, but I kind of became with a lot of my generation who came up with the Obama campaign pretty disenchanted after the um, bailouts of the banks started happening, the wars continued, um, and I moved to Brooklyn to join Occupy Wall Street, which was, you know, the continuation of a movement that started in the Middle East and um, Europe and that we brought to, to New York. And, um, you know, this was my second thing. I was like, okay, so if elections didn't work, it, it's so centralized, so hierarchical of these elections. Let's try something more peer-to-peer, -peer, more democratized. Um, and, and Occupy Wall Street was what I landed on. But while it had some lasting implications, it didn't really build anything tangible. Um, and, and I wanted that to be the sort of the next thing that I tried, um, but still very much with a political bend. My co-founder, too, he has, you know, I'm closer in age to his son than to him. He is already built and sold a big lab automation company. Um, his background is in optics and he helped commercialize QPCR really early on. Um, and so he is much more the like traditional lab automation hacker um, and 
and that's the background that he really brought to the story. I hope that one day you guys will get a chance to hear his story as well. He's amazing, one of my best friends um, from the last eight years. Um, and, and we really came together to build this thing. Um, where we met was <laughs> the DIY biology listserv. This is just a fun piece of trivia. Because, you know, Q was um, basically, he was like, why am I going to pay $10,000 to get this stupid key town replaced when there's all this open source hardware for 3D printers and I can just slap a pipette on it and I can do the same thing <laughs> pretty much, you know? Um, and, and that's what the prototype that he built here, this Biobot prototype, um, we, he changed the name to OpenTrons before I bought the first, the first unit actually for my master's program. Um, and let's see, this, yeah, this is what it looked like back then. Ran on an Android app, which is just a terrible idea. Um, and you can probably recognize the like Shikoko open source gantry and save a lot of money by using a manual pipette rather than design your own pipette from scratch and you just actuate it with a stepper motor. Um, and it worked. I mean, it's kind of ugly, but it worked to pipette. <laughs> um, and so the, wait, this is, so this is me way over caffeinated at the ITT. So ITT is a program at NYU. Um, that was that interactive telecommunications degree that you guys heard, but it's, it's in the art school, the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. Um, the founder of Arduino teaches there. Um, the founder of MakerBot teaches there. It's just a very sort of New York open source focused um, master's degree. And OpenTrons was my, my thesis. Um, so how did I get there from campaigning in Occupy Wall Street? Um, that it's, it, it's a great question. Um, you know, the, there are a couple of transitions that happened in my thinking. One, as I said, was I wanted to build something tangible. Um, and when does building something tangible also equate to a, a political act? Well, when you give somebody a tool that they didn't have before, you're giving them power. that They can now do something, capacity they didn't have before. It's uh, empowerment, quite, quite literally. Um, and so I was really interested in, you know, taking some type of technology that's super powerful and putting it in a lot more people's hands. And so what's the most powerful and important technology? <laughs> I think we can probably all agree on this call that it's biotechnology. It's how we feed ourselves. It's how we heal ourselves. If we're going to survive on this planet, it's how we need to make more things. Um, and, and yet, it's the least accessible technology, biotechnology. It's the least accessible. It's the one that you can only create something in the world if you're a billion dollar institution, right? Um, and so to me, democratizing the means of producing biotechnology seemed like this really uh, important political project. Um, and I still think it is. And this tool seemed like it maybe could be the way to do it because you know, I was at Gen Space learning how to pipette, which is the biohacker space in, in Brooklyn. I was taking like the biohacker boot camp. Um, and I was like, why can't I download this experiment and hit run like I can on my 3D printer? Like, why am I learning how to pipette like this? Um, and that's when I saw, you know, Q's email and was like, oh, that's the machine that we're gonna, you know, now I can just put a thingiverse of protocols onto this 3D printer of experiments. Um, and that's just going to be my art school thesis. <laughs> um, and, and that's this, this picture here. And, but what actually ended up happening was we started to sell these things um, to real scientists who hated pipetting and needed an open source platform. You know, they're designing experiments in code, analyzing data in code and running experiments by hand. And they're like, we need that robot so that that is a full digital loop. Um, and, you know, I'm 26 at this point. I know absolutely nothing about, like, running a company. Um, much more qualified to, you know, set up a blockade of the stock exchange than to run a business. But Chu, on the other hand, is very qualified. And he also grew up in Hong Kong. Um, and 
knows that supply chain really, really well just from being of, of the place. And Shenzhen, as you all probably know, is a hotbed of, I would call it, um, you know, it's kind of beyond open source innovation in, in that there's no like proprietary versus open source. It's just all this Shenzhen idea of like innovation piled on innovation and going there where they're cranking out millions of 3D printers um, meant that our supply chain, we were bringing a new supply chain to lab automation. And that's kind of our biggest commercial innovation is we didn't invent lab automation, but we made it way cheaper by using open source and a different supply chain. Um, so we go to China um, and I don't know if you guys have been there, but it's um, very cool, <laughs> but also really intense. Uh, like this is one of the electronics markets. They're just huge malls of parts. Um, and then I don't know if you guys should check out the, the Kickstarter, but um, it was made in this back closet of, of Hackcelerator and that robot pictured there squeaked like crazy. So you can't imagine like the terrible din that was going on um, during this whole, whole movie, but I'll just play some of it so you get an idea. Um, I don't know if, is the sound coming through for you guys? Maybe. It doesn't really matter, but you can see that, uh, you know, you can't hear the squeaking. <laughs> you can't tell that it's just in a closet. So, you know, you can do a lot with a, a back closet um, and some, some decent lights and a big black sheet. Um, and, you know, when we launched the Kickstarter, I really thought we were going to be selling to people like me, like hacker people at, at maker spaces and stuff. Um, and we sold a few to those folks, but we sold like 30 to serious professionals. And I was surprised. Chu was not surprised. Chu, my co-founder, knew that this was something people really needed and wanted in the market. But I, I didn't realize that what we were building was actually something that real biologists wanted. I thought it was something that someone aspiring to like bring biotechnology into their skill set would want. Um, and this is really when it changed for me from like, oh, this is a cool sci-fi art project to we need to build this thing. Like this could honestly um, you know, if nine out of 10 labs aren't automated today and we can automate those nine out of 10 labs, then we just 10x global life sciences bandwidth. And that's important. We need that. Um, and so, you know, the Kickstarter for me was really the moment when I realized what we were, what we were really doing and, um, and when it really changed for me to be like, you know, I, I have to, I have to dedicate myself to really making this work um this isn't just a cool kickstarter project and just some shots of of building the first ones that's my friend mitch in china on the right and choose garage in new jersey on the left um you know just some classic startup um and our <laughs> our office below gen space you know <coughs> and let's see is there a better picture of the robot um yeah, I mean, this is, Drew Indy took the picture on the left in my family's garage in Palo Alto. And on the right, this is where we're, we're installing it. Um, and building these relationships with, this is, this is just outside of Cambridge, actually. I wonder if anybody knows Lewis, who is just such a charming individual and one of the um, early Kickstarter backers of OpenTrons and one of the first people, I'll say, to really get the robot to help him <laughs> instead of just be a cool toy. Um, and um, yeah, I took this picture outside of Cambridge. Um, and so, you know, just to, to look again at this machine, um, let's see, is there one right now? Uh, this is all open source parts, um, all off the shelf parts or 3D printed or laser cut. Um, so it's off the shelf, 3D printed or laser cut, and all the electronics are open source. So we didn't have to invest in tooling. 
um, in, in like a mold. So that usually a hardware company, your biggest expense is going to be the big mold for your all your custom parts. And you're going to either extrude something or you're going to injection mold something or whatever. And we didn't have any money. And so we, again, just strapped manual pipettes onto basically an open source gantry, um, added some ease of assembly type of design um, and, and bought it from the Shenzhen supply chain, which was, you know, high throughput or like very productive, um, very efficient at shipping. Um, but, and, and this robot didn't work for everyone, right? But I'll, I'll get there in a second. The next thing, so after we sort of proved that we had early adopter interest, that's when we joined Y Combinator, which is the classic startup accelerator in Silicon Valley. Um, and this is really where we started, I, where I learned what a business is and, and how to grow a business. Um, and where we found, you know, the traditional model for selling lab equipment is to go door to door and, and try and sell it in person. Um, if we're selling something so cheap, then we can't, we don't have a 20% profit margin. We don't have 20% of our sale price, AKA $50,000 to give a salesperson every time they successfully fly out somewhere and sell something. So that whole traditional commission-based in-person sales model would work for us. This is where we just iterated until we found basically that a Skype demo with, um, you know, if you return, you can return it for free within 30 days. Um, and that worked really well. And we had a lot of returns. I mean, not a lot, maybe, you know, one a month it, to begin with. Um, and then as the product improved, fewer and fewer. And at this point, basically we have zero returns, but, um, we also started picking up some key, like Coastal Ventures put in a million dollars. And then John Vidal, who is now our CEO, um, was an angel investor. And we met him through GenSpace. He already built and sold a company to Amazon. Um, and, and he invested in that first Y Combinator round. These are just some like, you know, classic startup. We all fit at, a at one single table, <laughs> crazy. And Henry, the head of our uh, assembly crew, rescued a baby squirrel and kept it in the office for a little while. You know, typical startup hijinks. Um, one really crucial addition was Kristen Ellis, who's now my fiance and partner. Um, and But she was really the first professional pipetter, like a researcher. She came from MD Anderson, where she ran like bed to bench side cancer, cancer clinical trials. Um, and she was the first like user on the team. Yeah, I obviously am not a professional with a pipette. Um, and and Chu, you know, is a professional lab automation expert. And so Kristen was like our would be prototypical user. And um, so that was really key. But as you can tell by looking at these women's faces on the right, this was not a product that was ready for most bench scientists. Um, this was something that like the, the, you know, Stanford bioengineering kids loved, but uh, these women who just want to get their experiments run without fiddling with fancy tech weren't, it wasn't ready for them. Um, so even though we sold over 700 OT1s, we knew that it wasn't the right tool to automate every single biology lab in the world. Um, and I think this this graphic, I think, is really instructive for any startup. Um, it, you know, you, when you're going to get to the most of your market is this group to the right, which expects um, people who want complete solutions and convenience, right? They expect that your product is finished. Um, the innovators and the early adopters are okay with a minimum feature set. They just really want it to work. They, they believe in your story. Um, and, and they're going to try really hard. Uh, the, the other people, you know, most of the market isn't going to try hard, you know? Um, and I, this is where I am for most things. I'm, I was not an early iPhone adopter, right? Like I, I, I identify with that segment of the market. I, I want a robot that just plugs in and works. And the OT1 was not that robot. Um, and so that's when we raised our Series A and started building the OT2. Um, and the most key, and these are just some early 
renders and, and prototypes of the OT2. Um, but the real key innovation of the OT2 is not using manual pipettes anymore, using um, electron, like fully integrated pipettes. Um, and also, you know, in using our own tooling. Now we could invest in tooling. So there's aluminum extrusion that's our own. Um, there's some bent sheet metal, some cut and ground sheet metal. Um, and then obviously the pipettes are injection molded. Um, and this is when we picked up the MakerBot team. So this is Taylor Goodman. Uh, the <laughs> The he's the head of hardware still at OpenChon. He basically built the Replicator 2, which was the real breakout MakerBot. Um, and so we brought him on and his favorite project product manager and his favorite industrial designer and then a bunch of engineers. And, um, you know, now we've got a lot of MakerBot team, but they were really instrumental and in, they built that they designed and built the OT2 um, and, and made it you know, a machine that we could ship thousands of and that would drop on the ground and work. Um, but we had another problem, which was the only way you could create an experiment uh, to, for, you know, a protocol for the robot to run was to write Python. And, and that's great. A lot of people love that. We have a Python API um, and we're about to launch a HTTP REST API for those of you interested. But uh, most biologists don't want to dive into the code. Um, most of them, I, you know, want the thing just to work. And that requires a, basically a point and click um, protocol interface. So if you go to designer.openchallenge.com right now, you can try out our protocol designer at this point. It's, it's there, but it, in the summer of 2016, it was still just stickies on a wall. Um, we launched, <laughs> we, there's still some, I think you can find the uh, command in the OT2 that, I think it's OT2 dance. I think it's still an Easter egg in there that, that does that, um, FYI, anybody interested. And then um, I'll sort of blur through this because this is a bit more, this, was, this deck was for uh, a presentation I gave to the company. And so this is a lot of just like good call outs, but this is really where we built out our um, sales and customer facing team. And rather than going from the mode of like, oh my God, if we don't sell another two robots, like we're gonna not, we're gonna be short for um, our pay, you know, for paying people this month. Um, we started hitting our growth targets and having enough money in the bank so that, you know, I, I like to say that startups have to earn every, uh, every top metric besides monthly revenue. And so once you have monthly revenue under control, you can add another metric and ours was activation rate, basically how fast and how well are people getting their robot to do what they want it to do. Um, and so that's more of a, a, you know, that's a product quality metric, not a ability to sell something metric. Um, and, and that really was the first thing that we started investing in, in 2018 when we launched the OT2 and uh, this is this is the roadmap that we shared in the 2019 um, Q3 all hands um, that basically shows my contention, and I think it proves out, is that when these things were completed was when we hit that product market fit for the mainstream biologist and, and beyond, beyond with the OT2. Um, and so, you know, we, we finished some of our last shipping and logistics efficiencies gained. Um, we launched the API V2, which had some overhauls in the way that the robot calculates movement, always improving that stuff. The Gen 2 multi-channel pipette was the most essential one. Um, basically, the Gen 1 was a great piece of kit, but was poorly designed for manufacturing. And which meant that our things were coming off the line with more problems than they should have. The Gen 2 fixed all that. So basically making it, our multi-channel pipette much more robust, <laughs> um, much needed improvement. Um, and, you know, the other one that I'll just, I'll keep cruising pretty fast here, the modules in PD down here um, in protocol designer, 
that was making it so that you could engage your temperature module, your uh, magnet module, your thermocycler, the, basically the modules that go on the OpenTron. That feature was not in the point and click interface until we finished it. And once it was in there, that brought the point and click interface to the same level of capability as the Python. Um, and so, you know, all of these different things really by the end of 2019 meant, okay, now we've got the right product for the mainstream biologist, not just a hacker platform anymore. Um, here we go. And that of course is when COVID hit. Um, and so, I, can I just do a quick time check? How am I doing on time? I don't want to. Um, yeah, sorry, well, I was just about to say if, another couple of minutes, but if you could um, okay. wrap it up ish. <laughs> thanks. Two minutes? Yeah, yeah, One two minute? or three minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, almost there. Um, so, in, we all know what, what happened um, and how it directly pertains to our, our growth curve was um, in the United States, and I think around the world, a lot of the similar stuff happened, the, these emergency use authorizations kicked into place. So instead of, uh, and what that meant for open trons was now we could be used in a diagnostic context. And so um, to make a long story short, we ended up um, shipping over a thousand robots over 2020 um, to hospitals, in most of them in Spain and Northern Italy and the United States. Um, we also worked with Oxford Nanopore to do a lot of COVID sample prep for their situation um, using their MinION. Um, and you know, basically the first half of 2020, our goal was to be able to have run a million tests by July 1st. And we probably were at 3 million tests by July 1st. Um, and you know, by the summer, there was over a million tests a month getting run on our robots and hospitals around the world. Um, and, you know, if we hadn't completed uh, this, we would not have been able to do that, right? Um, and I'll skip this video, but um, the next thing that happened is because we installed so many robots into COVID labs, we figured out how to run automated COVID lab really well. And we set up a lab in New York City that is still running over 20,000 tests a day. Um, this is Mayor Bill de Blasio here, um, standing next to our robot. Um, and, and this is just part of our, our automated lab running COVID tests. We're able to run them for $30 a test, which is uh, about $70 cheaper than the next best offer for the, the big public hospitals here in, in New York City that are our customers. Um, and at this point, Open Trans is over 500 people. Um, we announced on Thursday that we closed a $200 million financing from SoftBank. Um, and I am officially no longer in charge. Uh, we, we have, I mean, our CEO who came on after Y Combinator, John Badal, is, is still leading the charge. And we brought on um, some executives from big tech companies to uh, to grow because our basically being able to run an affordable COVID test um, more more affordable than anybody else also means we can run any type of PCR diagnostic more affordably than anybody else. Um, and so we're going to be growing this um, to make cheaper diagnostics across the board. Um, and installing our, our labs in lots of different ge geographies. So, okay, thank you. Um, look forward to your questions at the end. Great, thank you, Will. That was uh, really interesting. I think that's gonna lead quite nicely into uh, Nicola's talk as well. So uh, just to introduce our second speaker, uh, Nicola Patron is a research group leader in plant molecular and synthetic mm -hmm. biology at the Ehlem Institute on the Norwich Science Park. And in 2015, she was recognized by SymbioLeap as an emerging leader in synthetic biology. Nicola also leads the Ellen Biofoundry, a facility developing automated nanoscale workflows for biology and biotechnology, which includes, I believe, some open trans. Uh, and Nicola's going to be telling us about the Biofoundry today. Thanks, Nicola. Thanks, Steph. I will just share. Great. 
So thanks, for, thanks so much for inviting me to speak today. It's really nice to be here and to be part of the Symbio Forum. Um, so as, as Stephanie said, I'm a group leader at the Earlham Institute. So for those of you that don't know much about the Earlham Institute or haven't heard of it, we're an independent nonprofit bioscience research institute that has core funding from UKRI and we're based on the Norwich Research Park. Um, we were founded in 2009 to focus on data-driven biology. So we're about 115, 120 people, mainly working in 12 research groups. And we have a shared interest in the use of genomics, computational biology and engineering and AI to answer fundamental biological questions, develop new biotechnologies and conserve biodiversity. So there's many groups working across different areas and everything from koala bears to cichlids to wheat and arabidopsis. And my group works on um, plant molecular and synthetic biology. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we do in a minute, just to continue introducing myself. But um, as has been mentioned, I have a second role as the PI of the um, Erlen Bio Foundries, which is one of three core facilities at our institute together with sequencing and high performance computing. So to briefly introduce myself and my work, this is my research group and the work in my lab spans three interconnected areas. So the first of the things that we're interested in is to understand regulatory sequences and um, gene regulatory networks. We're particularly interested in the intrinsic properties of gene regulatory sequences, how functional elements and their relative arrangements contribute to regulatory function. And we're also interested in how these elements contribute to um, function in gene regulatory networks, um, inspired particularly by work in um, microbes. We're interested in understanding how quantitative plant phenotypes emerge from network functions. So the second thing that we work on is to investigate metabolism. And here we're interested in unpicking the genetic basis of specialized metabolites um, and understanding how novel chemodiversity evolves. And we integrate genomics and metabolomics and transcriptomics to do this. And then these are two research areas come together to complement each other in our projects that aim to engineer the biosynthesis of particular metabolites of interest. So here we combine our no uh, knowledge of the genetic basis of um, biosynthetic pathways with our understanding of regulation to build and optimize gene circuits and networks to maximize the yield of target molecules. But today I'm here to talk about the foundational uh, technologies that underpin our work. Um, and I think in the last 15 to 20 years, the application of synthetic biology approaches to both regulation and metabolism in microbes has been phenomenal and effort put into the development of tools and workflows to make those systems easy to engineer at scale have really, um, I guess, paid dividends in the increase of the sophistication of experiments that have led to advances in um, discovery science as well as uh, biotechnology and we kind of move from this era, era of small specialized tools and parts into these through an era um, of large parameterized collections where we can use automated protocols and rule informed design and I think in microbes that field is already moving into our high throughput design build test cycle with um, machine learning incorporated into um, that design process. But thinking about that um, design build test cycle, those uh, underpinning um, uh, foundational principles of engineering, uh, standardization, autom automation are all really interconnected to enable you to conduct experiments at this scale and for that data to be repeatable, robust, and preferably to miniaturize those reactions so that the individual cost of experiments are low, we need to use laboratory automation. So for a protocol to be automated, it also needs to be optimal. And because of the efforts required to develop robust automated uh, protocols, then the tools that you use should be reusable and they should also be standardized in some way. Um, so a lot of the work that we do um, is uh, molecular biology. And it's quite clear here and in microbes that this is often um, starts from putting pieces of DNA together. So uh, phys the physical assembly of DNA into larger molecules. Um, so to start 
to start applying these um, to plant sciences, which was, I think, a particularly bespoke field with people working in very individual ways uh, with a particular toolkits, um, we first needed to establish community standards. So going back seven or eight years, the plant community were beginning to adopt uh, DNA assembly methods rather than um, kind of uh, individual gene by gene cloning. Um, in particular, um, type 2S assembly methods or golden cake. And these methods are particularly amenable to automation because they only require the combining of DNA in, and in, to an enzyme cocktail without any intermediate steps of electrophoresis or purification. So it's basically 90% liquid handling. So it's very easy to automate. It's also very easy to standardize via the assignment of um, specific bases to either ends of the individual parts that you're gonna assemble. However, the situation that we faced when this new technology started to emerge, and I think this is probably says quite a lot about the individualistic nature of scientists, is that different groups of people started using different configurations, meaning that the parts that created were there by definition no longer exchangeable or reusable within labs and we're starting to see lots of duplications of effort and you get back to the situation where everyone's using a very slightly different version of um, you know pr promoters and reporter genes which really undermines the uh, application of any kind of um, reproducible reproducibility but certainly um, robust automated experiment. So um, we, by which I mean myself, but or Jim Hasselhoff particularly, and some others then led the establishment of community standards to try to reach an agreement on what the standard should plant should be. Um, uh, and th that was quite successful. And we published that back in 2015 with a very large group of people from across the community. And then that served as a basis for other people in, I, I guess, related um, uh, research communities to nucleate. So then we've seen, you know, uh, the algal community with the clammy loclo and um, uh, the uh, people with kits for engineering chloroplasts and for cyanobacteria as well. Um, and these are where things biologically make sense somewhat intercompatible, which is great. and makes it much easier to work with other people. Um, so with that, uh, with that in place, it then made sense for us to be able to um, uh, start thinking about automation and I think um, also making better open source molecular tools and Jim's lab in particular led on this um, within from within the open plant consortium um, developing um, uh, different toolkits um, for that use these um, standardized parts to enable um, uh, standardized DNA assembly of um, constructs of different scales for working with plants. And then working in the Earl and Bio Foundry, then we developed automated workflows. And we were then particularly working with our um, lab site ECHO, or we were particularly wanted to achieve automation at the sub microliter reaction volumes. And we did this working with the lab site ECHO, which uses acoustic energy to move um, liquid around rather than tips. And this is great because uh, it was working at the nanoscale, which means you can bring your reaction volume down to sub microliter quantity. So our reaction volumes go from being 15 to 20 microliters uh, if you're doing them manually down to being, you know, anywhere between 250 to 750 nanoliters if you were doing them um, on a tipless platform. So in this platform, uh, we set up our source plates, which might have things like uh, your master mix, your source plasmids, and then the different parts that you want to assemble. Um, so here we're just kind of showing uh, basically a set of different coding sequence that you might be assembling with four different sets of promoters and terminators. So these all sit on the plate that's sitting the right way up in the machine. And then um, the receiving plate is inverted above that. Um, and the nano volumes of liquid are then uh, transfer, transferred with um, the source plate being um, vertically displaced into the required wells so that then you get your 384 reactions. 
So then we have our down, downstream process or post assembly process, uh, which um, involves obviously transforming that into um, bacteria, plating that bacteria, picking those colonies and prepping them. Um, so we have those automated on a range of different platforms, depending on the size of the project and what else is going on in the biofoundry. Um, so these include um, the Hamilton Star and also the Opentrons. Um, we've also just taken delivery in the last week of a large scale colony picker, um, and that's because we're doing quite a few projects with large libraries at the moment. Um, and then when we have our, uh, when we've prepped our DNA or when we have those colonies, then we um, obviously need to validate those. And we also do this at different scales. So that could be either um, uh, with some kind of digestion, and then we can have an on deck micro kind of electrophoresis, or it might be going through directly for, for sequencing on different platforms. We've used Illumina, PacBio, MinION for different um, projects of different scales for validating those DNA assemblies. So being able to assemble lots of constructs is really wonderful, but it does, of course, push that a bottleneck of um, research downstream to characterization. Uh, and in my lab, we do quite a lot of characterization of both uh, transcription factors and of different enzymes in metabolic pathways. Um, so in the last year or so, we've also made a toolkit uh, to enable cell-free protein expression based on the same principle. So these enable us to um, do high throughput uh, nanoscale DNA assembly and move on to uh, miniaturized um, protein expression. So looking at that in a little bit more detail, um, our toolkit takes parts in our Phytobrick standards so we can uh, simultaneously use the same parts either for um, expression, for example, in our transient implant expression system or in cell-free expression. Um, it did take quite a lot of effort to optimize the transfer protocols for the viscosity of the cell-free protein synthesis reagent, but we do have that working in about uh, a one or two microliter reactions. And this plot here is just showing you that we get um, uh, a similar yield as we do in a larger 15 microliter manually pipetted um, reaction. Um, so the ability to construct and test at scale has been particularly useful for identifying expression configurations that work for individual proteins. So if any of you know that when we had the joy or lack of joy of working with protein expression, you will probably know that some express beautifully and others, even when they seem to be incredibly similar, just give very poor yields. Um, and I, I can't tell you that we found any magic bullet to be able to say um, what's a good a set of tags or configurations for identifying how to express any particular protein, but I can say that we are now in a position to be able to scale up those types of experiments and generate the data that would allow us to investigate this. So here we've just got a panel of different proteins, all very closely related that we're trying to express, and you can just see that for each of them there is a different configuration in which they actually express the best and that you can get the best protein you to go forward with. So to enable that um, rapid quantification, we also uh, have um, adopted this high bit tag, which is a really small uh, nine amino acid tag that has minimal interference with our protein, although we can also make it cleavable. And that allows us to do high throughput quantification on uh, for um, protein yields on plates as well. So we can kind of go from um, DNA assembly to protein synthesis to quantification of protein expression all on uh, 384 plates, which is really fantastic. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, my slides. I just got a very brief spinning wheel of death. But I, here I'm probably drifting more into the benefits of um, pro cell free protein synthesis of automation. But just to conclude that story, what's really nice for us is that we can move directly from um, expression to purification without any type of, uh, sorry, expression to screening without any type of uh, purification. And we've um, lots of different types of assays that we can conduct directly in our synthesis reactions without any modifications. So this is just showing um, enzymatic uh, ability of UDP glucosyl transferases to add uh, UDP moieties onto metabolites, um, geraniol and uh, what's that, nepetalactol. 
um, working directly in that cell-free lysate. Uh, we've also got um, uh, um, synthesis of irregular monoterpenes um, from uh, isoprene subunits um, and also direct uh, in vitro um, validation of transcription factors binding to particular DNA motifs in electro um, mobility shift assays. So I've said a little bit about standards uh, and automation and what they can help to achieve uh, or what we've been able to use them for in my own lab. So in the last few minutes, I just want to say a little bit about making those capabilities available to a wider group of scientists. So as I mentioned, our automation platforms are available in our biofoundry. So what's a biofoundry? These are laboratory infrastructures that enable the rapid design, construction and testing of um, genetically reprogrammed organisms for biotechnology. Uh, they, in, they aim particularly to integrate these hardware systems of different types together with software for design and analysis and those biological systems and methods. Um, so uh, what do they do for the biosciences? As physical facilities, they provide the bioscience community with automation platforms that does everything that you expect automation to be able to do, increase reliability and robustness, uh, decrease reaction volumes and cost, enable reuse and interoperability. Um, but I guess more importantly, they're a source of expertise on the uh, application of synthetic biology approaches to um, experimental design as well. So. Um, the mission of our particular biofoundry, and we're one of uh, uh, four or so in the UK, is to provide a national resource for the UK community to engage with high throughput automation and um, to help those people wanting to perform large scale experiments, uh, particularly complementing the strength of our Norwich research part, but we have collaborators across the UK and also people using our biofoundry from South Africa and Belgium and the United States. Um, we particularly aim to enable new research directions and approaches that will drive innovation and also to train researchers in synthetic biology approaches um, and the use of automation. And we're part of a larger global network of biofoundries that exist around the globe, of which are around 50, I believe, right now in that membership that have similar missions. So as I've also already mentioned some of our platforms. So in addition to those, we have a platform for microfermentation, the biolector for uh, automated storage in the Arctic. As I said, we've got um, liquid handling systems of different, sca different scales, uh, colony picking reaction, uh, colony picking platforms. Um, so if you want to use the biofoundry, um, we interact with us in different ways. You can access our established workflows, particularly those around DNA um, synthesis, uh, micro uh, fermentation uh, as a service. And you just get in contact with Jose to figure that out. And that is a very fee for service arrangement. But we particularly, our main, our main focus is collaborating with people on their work um, to, that can help automate new workflows and help people to do this. And then we also, um, either as either of these parts, I guess, they all interconnect with each other. Um, we have people that come and work with us, or we also run some training courses, particularly um, uh, aiming to improve skills in programming automation in the UK bioscience community. And we, we, we particularly do use our suite of OpenTrons to do that. Um, so examples of collaborative projects that we have are quite varied. Uh, I spoke about all the work that we did on DNA assembly. We've also automated um, growth challenge assays to identify the genetic basis of particular natural products. We've automated motility assays um, to look at, for example, how different um, residues in flagellin can uh, influence um, or, uh, the motility of bacteria. We're working with a few small companies, including Colorifics, on both DNA assembly and microfermentation to optimize yield. Uh, and we're also working uh, in an academic consortium to make a model library of cyanobacterium, again, with the aim of making that as a photosynthetic chassis for uh, biomanufacturing. 
Um, so I guess I'll finish there and I'll just say thanks to the numerous people in my lab uh, that have helped um, developing tools and workflows for automated DNA assembly. I think particularly Yao Min and uh, Jose and uh, Tony West, who's now left us. And for self, all the work with Self Free is really down to uh, Quentin Dudley, a postdoc who's just finished working with us quite recently. Thanks also to our many collaborators, and I think particularly to Jim today and really everyone in the Open Plant Consortium. And I will stop there. Fantastic. Thanks, Nicola. Um, yeah, I think uh, we're coming up on the hour, but um, if you guys are happy to stay for a little bit longer, um, we can do 10 or 15 minutes of, of questions. We've got a few questions in the q and I will pass over um, to Jim for this. Um, I'm sure most people on the call uh, are, will know Jim in some capacity, um, but if not, he is um, I'm group leader here at the University of Cambridge and one of the co-chairs of the Synthetic Biology Network. Thanks, Steph. Um, so as Steph said, there's a couple of questions already in the in the um, in, in the uh, queue. Uh, what I can do here is actually turn on people's microphones so they can ask their question. And Benedict, I'll just switch you on. Um, and just Benedict, for information's sake, is um, one of the founders of the UC2 project, which is a an open source approach to creating modular microscopy or optical devices. Benedict, can you um, can you uh, speak to the your questions? Yeah, hey Jim. Um, so first of all, very nice talks, both of them. Um, and so yeah, for, for the background, so we're, we're developing um, something which is maybe similar to the Arduino, but for optics. Uh, it's modular, open source, and we are also thinking about scaling it up because uh, the demand is kind of there. And I was wondering um, how OpenTron deals with licenses or patents. So I think in the second talk, we have seen some pipetting robots from Hamilton and Eppendorf and so, um, and how, I, well, I'm just curious because we're also thinking about eventually funding a, a startup. Uh, how likely is it that you get sued by another company um, regarding patents or licenses? Is there any interest or does it, cause any problem for you or do you actually pay the licenses? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, great, great questions. I, first off, I will say definitely see the market need for low cost open source automated microscopy. So well done on that. I, I think that that's definitely a important area to be pushing on. Um, in terms of IP strategy is sort of how I would categorize your whole um, your whole question. Um, so, you know, the thing, the thing to remember is that suing people costs money. And so somebody's get, if they are going to sue you, they have to have money. One, that means basically it's going to be a big company. Um, two, they, it, they'll only do it if they think that they're going to make more money by suing you than they're going to lose by not suing you you know it's it, like they have to believe that shutting you down and the millions of dollars that's going to cost will gain them more millions of dollars um in the future and then third you know they have to have an actual legitimate reason to sue you aka you violated one of their patents and mm -hmm. so you know by by using one of their designs and so we've completely avoided using anybody else's design that's you know job number one is don't don't infringe on the patent um you know, it's it's not always as clear cut as that, but I think that the important thing to remember is that, um, you know, people people treat patents like some sort of technical achievement award, and I'm not saying they're not a technical achievement award, but really what why they matter is for companies enforcing their own monopoly and uh, maintaining high profits, <laughs> and so um, that like just understanding that that's their purpose from a commercial perspective and that if you threaten that monopoly they're going to try and sue you but they have to actually believe that you're a viable threat for them to sue you and that they can actually win for them to sue you mm -hmm. um so yeah i i hope that that, that i could talk about this for it forever but i hope that is at least a, a bit of a high level over yeah, sure. No, I think that's that's about it. I well, I think the situation in microscopy is very similar. So 
well, the big companies, they uh, file patents for methods like Lightsheet or so. And I think you cannot just replicate it and sell it. But uh, right. I mean, yeah. So I think we have to dig into that a little bit. But um, well, I haven't seen any open source company, I think, that big as you are, uh, especially in open hardware, which got sued at all. So maybe it's just, I don't know, worth to try and see how, what happens. <laughs> Well, and I, I also think that there's some, uh, you know, we've never announced a fundraise until our $200 million round last week because we never wanted people to think we were a viable threat. You know, <laughs> a lot of it comes down to strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's true. <laughs> well, then, so now you have to be uh, a bit more careful, I guess. <laughs> well, we've never valid, like, we also are not infringing on any patent. Mm, you know, yeah. we, we, we don't do like, we've re, part of redoing our entire pipette um, was because we had our own approach that nobody else was doing. And, and part of the design requirements was that it wasn't anybody else's IP. So, um, and I would say like, I, I'm sure that there are lots of microscopy techniques that are like new and amazing um, that are patented, but I'm, I'm equally sure that there are solid enough ones that thousands of people can't afford to use in an automated way that are off patent now that you could democratize, make mm -hmm. affordable, make easy to use, and, you know, use something off patent. I see. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I also had a second question, maybe, um, since you're open source, um, well, and I know that you're engaging with your community through your GitHub um, forum and um, also integrating user demands and stuff. So um, how much do you rely on user feedback uh, in terms of, I don't know, innovative feedback so that you have it in new product? So uh, you, you mentioned that there will be a re redesign of the robot eventually. So is it that people from the community, for example, uh, we have one, we, we, I don't know, we, we made some um, things which eventually uh, were helpful. Uh, is it then integrated into your product so that the, the, the community is really participating in your product workflow? Or is it j just a dream eventually? <laughs> well, n no, I mean, it's definitely not just a dream. It, um, I'm not a biologist and so, all of my understanding for what a good lab robot looks like has come from customers and prospective customers. And so the feedback it is the most important thing and, and listening really hard to, to the biologist. And so, but I think you were also, um, you know, talking about more open, with the open source, it's more than just, you know, customer feedback. It's also maybe the chance that they will develop a feature for you that you sort of pool into your code base. Um, and that has happened. Um, for example, our like our our hotkey um, for calibration for using ASWD and, and some other good hotkeys were open source contributions, just sort of small features. Um, but mostly being open source, seeing people's hacks, then that's like, okay, we got to build that in a feature. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's it, you know, being open source is a, a customizability feature for integration. That's one way of thinking about it. Being open and those people who are customizing um, are future product ideas that you can bring to the 90% of folks who aren't open source hackers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we have our software license which is you know copyright law so you can have a, a license on software and that's the apache open source license um and then we have the cern and the open source hardware uh stamp on our electrical boards um because you can open source hardware basically pcbs um that's a known thing to do but then when you start talking about mechanical designs, um, you, that's no longer copyright law, that starts being patent law. And, um, and so basically you're, you're left with two choices. One is you patent your design and then create some sort of open source license that people could then license, or you just don't do anything. 
and we and for the mechanical designs we've just not done anything we've put up um, the designs that we think can be helpful to our customers for integrating, aka like the whole robot as a CAD file. Um, but what we haven't done is put up like exactly the tooling design for our aluminum extrusion, which the only person that would care about that is another factory trying to replicate our, our machine. Um, so um, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, not like uh, canonical, nice, easy to use ways yet. Um, but if you are comfortable SSHing into the Raspberry Pi on the robot, that's very doable as long as the Raspberry Pi is on a network where that's possible. So um, if you want to go from home, that and then the Jupyter Notebook is is kind of the one level up of user interface on that, which I think was also Benedict's suggestion. Um, so if you if you look on our um, our help forum, I think that the Jupyter Notebook is the recommended suggestion there. But I know a lot of people also are kind of SSHing into the Raspberry Pi on the robot and you know hitting enter on a Python protocol that you want to run. I have a question for Nicola, but I'd just also point out if anyone in the audience has a question they'd like to to ask, then just stick your hand up with the the Zoom function raise hand and, and we'll uh, get you on board. But in the meantime, Nicola, I have a question for you because a lot of the tools and technologies that you're developing have a sort of interesting parallel with genome scale assembly, particularly in the SC 2.0 project and both the um, assembly side of it and the analytical side of it employ you know, a lot of overlapping technologies, a lot of use of the lab site, echo, et cetera. And on, on your side of things, you and, and, and Osborne will be doing this amazing stuff with transient delivery and assaying combinatorial mixtures of genes, if I remember correctly, up to 15 genes at a time and reassembling pathways there. So can I ask you just to do a bit of crystal ball gazing um, about where you think things are going in the sort of like the five year time period? Because it does seem that you're establishing a foundation for both in a larger scale and also um, broader, you know, going wide as well as deep? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> um, it, I, it's, it's such a strange situation, I think. I, I think um, for those of us that started our careers manually assembling things in the labs and had all those problems, I find it in this remarkable situation now that you can have, you know, within a couple of days, you can have someone working mainly on the design of a project. So you don't really have to worry about them doing that assembly and what they're doing. So I, 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 I feel like the next big innovation really has to come in. Um, um, that in, in the design process and I think that's probably where the SC 2.0 innovations I think the things that are really impressive there with the software that they build for actually, the software that they actually wrote for uh, designing the genomes and deciding what they were going to build um, and how that and that could take in information on how those different strains performed and I think that's probably at the moment what we don't have um, so I, yeah I'm expecting I'm expecting us to now that we can do experiments of that scale we haven't really focused on too much on integrating either the modeling or the maths on figuring out uh okay so we can do a lot of combinations but we still probably can't do every single combinations especially when it gets to 15 genes so there probably there's definitely a statistical design of experiments to go in there so that we can cover that design space well and do that and i, I don't think that's, that's happening in a really big way except in the yeast field and probably if you know, a few, a few projects as well in um, bacteria, particularly Imperial. So I, I think probably, um, yeah, the next big revolution is gonna be uh, a lot more design thinking in, the, in upstream of actually <laughs> just chucking things onto your robot just because you can anymore. Because, <laughs> you know, once you can do a thousand, I think then the question becomes, but can you really afford to do 10,000? And you probably, you can't, because no matter how small you make it, it's still expensive. So then you have to figure out which thousand should I do out of my possible hundred thousand. Yes, yeah, so I had a follow-up question actually for you and then Will actually, 
which is what are the prospects of having an open source um, acoustic focusing based robot, essentially an open source echo. I mean, there may be a lot of patent issues to deal with, but the basic physical principle doesn't seem that outrageous as technical challenges. But I mean, th this would be like uh, making an accessible way of dealing with these higher throughput experiments. So Nicola, then will. Yeah, so um, th that's it's a great idea. So there are there are definitely some technical limitations in the setup as it is, and it would be really nice if to be able to play with that a little bit more. So there's things that they say that you can do that don't work so well, but I think that if you could play with them a little bit more, I think the transferring of cells and the arraying things on different shape plates and those kind of stuff would be would be could be so cool for lots of different organisms to work with but you kind of you know they've stuck to obviously what the biggest market is in micro volumes and micro tighter plates but i think the possibilities for the technology are far wider and it'd be really nice if it was a bigger group of people that could play in that space i think any thoughts will yeah i mean i 100 percent agree with what nicholas said and um i, I would just from my perspective of democratizing the means of producing powerful biotechnology, um, the main unlock of an acoustic liquid handler is the micro volumes, which means you're spending 10% on your reagent budget than you were spending before. And that is a ability that we need to make accessible to more labs. Like, you know, the, the, it's crazy to me that the, that gen space, you know, the teaching community lab in Brooklyn spends more per assembly than like Ginkgo Bioworks, right? And, um, and I mean, it's, it's because they can operate at scale, but it would be great if, if the, some of those scale benefits, like costs going down, um, could sort of accrue to the, the rest of the biotech ecosystem. And I do think that an open source acoustic handler, liquid handler could be one good way of doing that. Um, I, you know, I'm interested also in like the, the electro wedding, the digital microfluidics mm -hmm. space, although a lot of people have tried and failed to make that happen, but maybe one day that, that also could be a way of democratizing these micro transfers. And I, I want to ask a follow-up question of Nicola, if I can, which is how, um, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about at Opentrons as we've partnered with the Buco Lab and, and Neochromosome is building these bigger con constructs. And I'm curious because I, I legitimately don't know, it, say you had all of the software design tools to design a full from scratch um, eukaryotic genome, what needs to change in terms of your build process to be able to construct something sort of from scratch rather than subbing in genes? Um, does, that, does that make sense or am I off base? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not, I probably don't have enough experience to really know that. Um, if yeah, if you were not going to sub in genes and you were going to build it all in vitro and then transfer it in, I think there's probably still biological complications of some of those parts of the chromosome and whether they're stable or not. But I expect they are probably overcoming uh, overcomable. And I and I guess maybe the people working in that um in the yeast community probably know how to do that. I, I don't know, maybe do you, Jim, do you have any particular insight into that? Uh, not not I wouldn't uh... <laughs> No, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I, I guess there are still technical problems in knowing when you have when your pieces of DNA get to a certain scale. Even it becomes challenging and expensive to know then that they're correct, that they are not uh, recombining with each other, um, that they're stable in having things stable in vitro is one thing but then moving that moving large pieces moving large molecules of dna around is hard even extracting large pieces of dna extract chromosome scale extractions from living cells keeping them whole is hard so i think moving them around full stop is going to be difficult if you start to try to construct something as big as a chromosome in vitro and i think that's probably why people like the swapping in that you can just you know you go up to whatever it is those chunks and um, you swap out bits and swap them in. I don't, I don't, 
I think there are there probably are some significant challenges that are maybe just to do with the fragility of that DNA molecule, but also being able to validate that something that large. Because uh, we'll talked about, you know, trying to get um, automation out into, you know, nine out of 10 labs, trying to really roll this out in, in the biological community. What do you think are the main barriers at the moment to that? Is it we need more biofoundries or we need more training for people to use the robots? What, what will get us to that stage? Um, I don't think we need more biofoundries. <laughs> I may, I may, I, I, that may sound a little self-interested, <laughs> obviously, but I don't think, uh, I, I feel like um, we don't need more biofoundries in the way that we don't need more sequencing centers most of the ones that we have are not completely used and you know which is building expensive things so i think biofoundries the way we see ourselves um is to uh provide a place both for training and for access to the high-end automation that are not that people are never going to buy um probably even as of individual departments um and particularly if you want to find the best piece of automation platform for, for doing a particular project and you need to try a few and you need expertise. It's, it's, a, cent it's a center of expertise plus equipment. But um, we do, for example, invest quite a lot of time in trying to train people to become better at programming automation because I don't think biofoundries will necessarily be around forever, at least not in the, not as they are now, the types of automation within them um, uh, will or should at least change and keep going forwards and staying at that cutting edge. Whereas we do expect um, the bioscience research, re, um, bioscience community to become uh, better at <laughs> programming automation and to be able to work on smaller scale automation platforms. And we, we see those as being entirely compatible. So we see people that have an open chance in their own lab and can know how to do experiments at the 96 well or a 384 well stage will then start thinking bigger and say okay well now I've done this I now I now need to do something bigger can you do this can you scale this up the the step for people that have never used any kind of automation to working with the biofoundry they've got no idea how to design an experiment of 10,000 so we, 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 we're quite we're quite keen on both we're quite keen on both enabling the community to be able to learn how to program and to work with automation at the scale that we believe is affordable in every lab and we'd like to see in every lab but also to continue to provide a center for expertise and access to equipment that we um yeah that we don't think that people really ever, you know you don't you don't need to buy a, a, an echo to do your experiment that says in reality it's going to cost eight minutes to set up then you need to buy an hour of time on the echo to do that and then you go away and do your experiment so yeah. Then is there, is there, I guess, training in, in the programming skills, but also training in the how to think about designing experiments in an automated way? Yes. Yes. So I think I think there needs to be more of that. We do have plans to input. Well, I have to say our whole training plans did get totally derailed by COVID because <laughs> we, did, we, we don't. Some of these things can be delivered remotely, but there's some aspects of it really, really can't. And there's not really that much value in them. But yeah, that's that was our plan. Um, uh, actually, the um, some people at Newcastle have done some really good work in uh, developing short courses and, for example, um, design of experiments and helping people to scale up in that design space. Um, so, yeah, we're hoping to build on that and integrate both um, programming, uh, yeah, skills in programming, skills in some synthetic biology tools and technologies and experimental design together. Thanks. And yeah, just to add my my perspective, I totally agree that like we don't need more of these super concentrated centers of excellence that do a great job already. And that's about about 30 percent of our customers are already highly automated labs like yours that just need an open trance to like add a little bit here or there that couldn't be that's like some other machine is too expensive for. But 70 percent of our customers have never had lab automation before in their lives. And we are now our average uh, 
five days is from when it lands to when it's producing the data that they want it to be producing in their lab. And that used to be 45 days. Um, and so we've, we've gotten really good at not only making the product better, but making the teaching materials and the onboarding materials a lot, a lot better. Um, but then I would say you've identified correctly, like there's a big gap between people who are like, I can't run another mini prep in my life. I'm going crazy. I just need it to save me an hour every day. Mm -hmm. And and being like, oh my gosh, this opens up bio design and you know different statistical tools than I've ever had. Like those are very different mindsets. Um, and and I think that you know learning that you don't have to do a thousand mini preps yourself is on the path to uh, unlocking DOE, but not everybody needs to get all the way there just to enjoy the first benefits of automation in the lab. Absolutely. The answer is not yet. Um, and I mean, our, our GitHub has all of the code that's ever been written, um, but it's not currently well curated for exposing all of the awesome innovations. Um, our blog follows a lot of them, definitely not exhaustive. Um, our Twitter, et cetera. It's, um, it's something, you know, that our ethos is, is like we live and breathe and die by our community's innovations on our open platform. Um, but it's interesting we never become a like do or die project to create that kind of hub yet um because really like most people need to build their when they're trying to do a custom integration they're trying to do their own thing really and we haven't seen that many reinventions of the wheel of people doing these custom integrations um that said now that we have a lot more resources i think we're probably you're going to see something like like a, a user form um, for, for open trunk coming up soon, but um, it, it hasn't been something we've built yet. And, and well, have you seen any kind of response from the conventional manufacturers, the Cybios, the Hamiltons, the Gilsons, in terms of their price points and the way they're marketing their, their own liquid handling robots? Yeah, I mean, I think that the one, uh, you know, I was at a, a genomics conference in San Diego in 2019, like spring, when Hamilton launched their 25K micro starlet or, or whatever it's called. Um, and, and that I think was sort of a, a shot at our market, so to speak. But the thing is that like their pitch for that is like, oh, do you have a $5 million super lab Hamilton? You can put this in the corner of your bigger liquid handler to handle smaller jobs while the bigger liquid handler is busy. And so they're not marketing to the nine out of 10 biologists that have never had lab automation before. So I think even though some of these companies see that you know we're having success at the lower price point, they don't understand the... Uh, transition from manual to automated pipetting that's happening at the small and mid-sized labs. They only still see their big, um, you know, I call them the mainframe customer of lab automation rather than the personal lab automation. Mm. Great. Thanks, Will. Um, does anyone have any last minute questions? Otherwise, I'll call the discussion to a close. And uh, thank well both Nicola and Will for great, great uh, talks and and also for the audience participation. It's been a very interesting session for me, certainly. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, have, a, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.